Hi there, my name is David A. Wheeler, and I'm here to talk about how to develop secure applications, in particular the Badge App example. First, the need. Computer systems are under attack. Just look at the news. Every day there's a new successful attack against some computer system. This means that if you are involved in developing software, then you must make it secure. This includes software developers, testers, and their managers too. But how do you develop secure software? What does that even mean? A big problem today is that many colleges and universities do not teach developers how to develop secure software. Even if they do, it's often an optional class. In addition, many software developers didn't go to a college or university to learn their craft. As a result, a lot of developers are unprepared to deal with the world as it exists today. Many software developers simply don't know what to do. Do you need to be some sort of wizard or a rocket scientist? Not at all. There are approaches you can take to develop adequately secure software without breaking the bank. I think anyone involved in software development needs to learn about these approaches. That brings us to the goal of this presentation. The goal of this presentation is to provide a real-world example of adequately secure software. Specifically, we'll be discussing the Badge App or Badge Application. The Badge App implements the Linux Foundation Core Infrastructure Initiative Best Practices Badge. I should note that I'm the technical lead of the Badge App project. Specifically, we'll be reviewing the Badge App Assurance Case. An assurance case is nothing complicated. It's simply information that justifies why we think the application is adequately secure. The real purpose of looking at this example is to help you create your own secure software. In particular, I hope that this example will show you some different and possibly more secure approaches. And I think examples are a great way to learn. I want to emphasize that no endorsement of any particular technology or organization is implied. I mention specific technologies and organizations merely as examples, not as the best or only way. I especially want to convince you that it is practical to create secure software. It does not require an infinite amount of money. In many cases, developing adequately secure software is primarily a matter of thinking ahead, avoiding certain bad approaches, and applying better approaches instead. You'll need to apply some additional measures, but they're often not massive investments in time or money. In short, secure software often doesn't cost noticeably more if you plan ahead. Since I'm using the Badge app as an, app, as an example, we need to talk a little bit about what in the world this application is. Now, your application will probably differ. That's fine. Uh, but we need to know at least what our example is all about. The Badge app is a very simple web application. Uh, more specifically, it enables open source software projects to fill in a form to show that they meet certain criteria. And if the projects meet certain cr those criteria, they get a badge. Uh, the overall Badge App project's goal is to encourage open source software projects to follow best practices as captured by those criteria. What this means from a technical viewpoint is that it's a simple web application where users fill in a form, check some, and it also checks some external data. The Badge application is written in Ruby on Rails and JavaScript. Uh, there's absolutely no requirement, of course, that your applications uh, use those technologies, uh, but that's just the technology that's used here. I'm talking about the Badge app as of September 2017. It's important to know that things always change, and that's fine, but I need to pick a particular time point, and so that's what I'm doing. If you're curious to see how this program actually runs, there's the URL. If you're curious to see its actual code and... Uh, various other things about the project, uh, the URL for that is available here as well. So first, let's start by talking about managing risk. It's important to understand that perfection in the real world is impossible. 
And instead, I want to convince you to have more of what I consider an engineering approach of managing risks, thinking about trade-offs. What is risk? Risk and it's very fundamental here is simply the probability and the impact of some successful attack. And we want to manage that. How do we manage it? Well, we identify our risks, try to reduce or eliminate the probability of impact, and really get to an agreement with all parties that this is good enough for the purpose. Now, since the arguments for this can be complex, uh, it's much easier to have some sort of structured way to organize our thoughts so that instead of being confused, we can stay uh, clear and consistent among everybody. An approach for doing this is something called an assurance case. An assurance case is simply a structured set of arguments and a body of evidence showing that an information system satisfies specific claims with respect to a given quality attribute. That's actually from a glossary. You can see the reference below. That sounds fancy. It really is not complex. An assurance case simply lets everyone understand what is, what has been done or what will be done. Why do you think this is secure enough? And the idea is to document this so that you can get agreement between all the stakeholders that this is enough and also so that you can justify it later. Uh, there may be a situation where something bad happens and you need to convince a court or customers that, yes, I did have due diligence. I did make reasonable, I did take reasonable steps. And an assurance case can help show uh, that you, what the, the steps that you take, that you took. The information that I'm going to show here is in a particular notation called Claims, Arguments, and Evidence Notation. There are other notations, uh, but I have to pick one. And if you're curious, that URL right there provides the actual assurance case with lots and lots of details. Before I go into the assurance case, let me talk about some key approaches. First, we applied defense in breadth across all the development processes from requirements all the way through operations. Security is more effective and less costly when you build it in ahead of time. And the assurance case helps you ensure that the security is always considered throughout this development processes. And this is assuming, of course, that you're developing your assurance case ahead of time. I do want to make one thing clear. I talked about requirements through operations, but in fact, we don't use a waterfall process. Uh, the uh, word process is not at all the same as the word stage. And this is a common confusion in the software development world. Um, when we talk about process in this case, what we're talking about is activities that take inputs and produce outputs. Stages, on the other hand, are periods of time. It's a common mistake. Uh, to try to apply a very strict waterfall on developing software. And in fact, this is an extremely risky approach. This was even identified by Winston Royce as extremely risky. It's important to understand that we take a variety of steps to reduce the likelihood and impact of vulnerabilities. Using a variety of te uh, techniques, such as design, safer languages, multi-tool static analysis, large test coverage, hardening, origin analysis, and so on. Um, I'll talk a little more about each of these, but indeed, there's a large number of them. We do reuse a large number of software components. That's normal today. However, we do check them first. We track them later, including updates and uh, checking for vulnerability reports. Uh, because we depend on these components, so we want to make sure that they're adequate for purpose. If a vulnerability is found and reported publicly, we can confidently update them quickly. Indeed, we can confidently update them in minutes if something is reported as being vulnerable. Uh, this is no magic. This is by planning ahead of time. The reality is that vulnerabilities in the software components that you depend on is you know, is an inevitable circumstance. So instead of being surprised and finding some process you have to work out the last minute, plan for that ahead of time. This is the top level figure in the assurance case. 
and at the very top you'll notice a key claim. The claim here is that the system is adequately secure against moderate threats. We're not trying to resist direct attack against a nation state. We're looking at much more moderate kinds of threats. Well, how can I support this claim? Well, there are two subclaims that would I that I claim will help us justify this top level claim. One is that the security requirements have been identified and met by their functionality, which you can see in the top left here. And the security is implemented in all the software development processes, which I'm going to break down further in, into the next figure. Now, how do I know that the security requirements have been identified and met by functionality? Well, security is often defined in terms of confidentiality, integrity, availability. And then, of course, you need to ask about what? About what assets? Against what threats? And so, indeed, we have identified all those major points. For confidentiality, almost all of our data is public except for the passwords and email addresses. This is a great approach, by the way. It, the best way to secure something is to not have to deal with it at all. Uh, you can't reveal information that you don't have. Uh, of course, like many applications, we can't do that in all cases. So the non-public data is kept confidential through a variety of mechanisms. First of all, our passwords are stored on a server as something called uh, iterated salted cryptographic hashes. In particular, we use something called bcrypt. You may not be familiar with the technical meaning of all this, but this is essentially the basic minimum requirements if you're storing passwords in a way that others can log into your system uh, to prove that they are who they say they are. Uh, I think anything less than this is just straight up negligence. If local users enable or remember me nonce, it's stored using certain cryptographic approaches to protect it. Uh, Emails are only revealed to owners and administrators. Indeed, we disable server-side caches uh, that contain emails so that caches won't leak email addresses to somebody else. Uh, HTTPS is used to keep data confidential when it's in motion. It's also used to protect the integrity of data as it moves between servers and clients. We do allow editing of data in this web application. Uh, indeed, that's one of its key functionalities, but it requires authorization. We identify who the individual is and whether or not they're authorized to make an edit before they make an edit. Modifica modifications of the actual software require authorization via GitHub. And how do we make sure that the system stays available? Well, we use cloud and CDN deployments to allow quick scale-ups. We use timeouts and multiple backups to uh, prevent it to reduce the effect of attacks and we can also return to operation quickly after some denial of DDoS attack has ended. Now those requirements and how we've met them overall sound great but indeed attackers often work around uh, approaches they work through seams so really to have effective security you really need to implement security throughout all the software development processes. And that's what we're going to talk about on the next figure. So, a key claim is that security is implemented in all our software development processes. Of course, we've already talked about requirements, but we also consider security in design, implementation, uh, our supply chain, in other words, our software we reuse, verification, including our testing, deployment and operations. We are concerned about our development environments. And of course, we also worry about our people and to prove, well, at least to justify all this that we've considered these, we have in fact received ourselves the CI Best Practices badge. Now, as far as design goes, let's look on the left. There's a number of things we do. First of all, we use a threat modeling approach called Strides, very, very simple approach where you just walk through the design and ask questions about the design uh, relating to security. That helps us identify any weak uh, any serious weak points in our basic design. We also have a simple design. We apply secure design principles, including all assaults and Schroeders. We'll talk about that in a moment. We have availability through scalability. Okay. Ideally, of course, we would be uh, perfectly resistant to denial of service attacks, uh, but how can we reduce the risk of being taken over by someone with a lot of resources? Well, we can help make it easy to scale up our system when necessary. 
We also use memory safe languages. Um, that's a very valuable design approach because by doing that, we eliminate certain kinds of vulnerabilities like buffer overflows for the most part. We'll talk more about the implementation itself. Let's talk about supply chain. We review uh, the code before we use it. Uh, this can be just simple of who's from, are people, are lots of other people using it, does it seem okay? Uh, we will go down and drill into actual reviewing code, uh, particularly in cases where we have some concerns. We automatically detect vulnerabilities whenever they're publicly reported. We use some tools to help us know right away when there's something that's been publicly reported. Uh, we use various countermeasures against man-in-the-middle attacks. Now, what about verification? Well, first of all, we have a policy that we our automated tests must cover at least 90% of the statements. And indeed, right now, we're at 100% um, uh, according to our tool. We release our code as free Libra open source software so anybody can view it, make comments. People have looked at it. Uh, we use uh, some... We use a software vulnerability scanner, uh, specifically a program called Breakman, which is designed to look at Ruby on Rails applications looking for security vulnerabilities. We use style checking tools. This makes sure that our code uh, is relatively clean. This makes it easier to analyze for vulnerabilities. It also makes it easier to read just for humans to analyze and that sort of thing. In fact, we use two different, we use several different ones, uh, particularly Rubocop for um, Ruby and uh, ESLint for JavaScript. And in, in fact, we use another one, Rails Best Practices, also for style checking. Now, what about deployment and operations? Okay, right here. Well, of course, we carefully pick our deployment providers. Um, we use various online checkers to make sure that when we deploy it, uh, certain aspects, in particular our HTTPS configuration, is correct and isn't weak. Uh, we also use a number of detection mechanisms uh, to detect uh, problems, including attacks, uh, both internal with logging, anomaly detection, and external. This is the point where I must stop talking about the details because indeed I don't want to give away to our attackers exactly how we monitor and what we monitor for. But suffice it to say that it's very, very valuable and important to do the monitoring so that even if our other measures fail, we can at least reduce the impact uh, by detecting when they happen. And of course, we have recovery, in other words, a set of backups in particular, so that we can recover if there is a problem. We do various protections for our uh, development environment. Uh, for example, we require certain uh, protections be turned on within Git. Uh, for people, in particular, um, uh, the lead, that's me, does know how to develop secure software. I actually teach about it. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, we've received a badge. It's, I think it's very helpful to try to find ways to identify external criteria so that you know that you're um, following a number of practices that are appropriate. I mentioned the design earlier. Uh, we have documented our design. Here's the picture. I'm not going to walk through all of this other than note that this is a fairly straightforward and relatively simple uh, kind of bog standard design where users at the top contact through a uh, content uh, a CDN and an, an HTTP router to a web server all the way down to a fairly straightforward model view controller with a database system in the back end. Um, we do have specialized kinds of users, admins and translators, uh, but they have to be authenticated separately. And we have looked through this design and used a modeling approach called Stride to walk through our major components and ask security questions about each part uh, to reduce the risk that we've forgotten something important. I mentioned earlier for design that we apply uh, secure design principles, including all salts or in Schroeder. So let me walk through here real quickly. First of all, economy of mechanism is an old phrase. It just means is your design as simple as you can reasonably make it? Uh, I believe the answer is yes. We certainly have strived for it. Fail-safe defaults. Uh, in particular, if we don't know who a user is, they don't have any privileges, for example, for editing. Complete mediation. We do mediate every single request. 
uh, that's privileged. Uh, open design. This means we don't depend on secrecy. We absolutely don't depend on secrecy of the design. Uh, indeed, all our code is open uh, for inspection. Um, now, separation of privilege. This talks about things like two-factor authentication. This is something that, as I'm speaking, we are currently transitioning to right now. Least privilege. We absolutely do strive to provide the least amount of privilege for different components of the system. Least common mechanism, we try to limit what's common, uh, be shared between different levels of uh, trustworthiness. Psychological acceptability. Uh, we use very standard, ordinary mechanisms for authentication because we know that users are not going to be interested in using odd, weird systems for that. We very much try to limit the attack surface. Um, and finally, input validation with whitelists. We check our inputs when they come in uh, against a whole bunch of different criteria. In particular, there are what's called whitelists. That is a pattern of what should it, of what is acceptable, as limiting as we can make them, and then reject everything that isn't acceptable. Is this making sense? I'm walking through a number of graphs, but these graphs are not fundamentally complex. The graph simply summarized the assurance case for this example system. The assurance case explains why we believe these actions are adequate for producing secure software. Now, it may or may not be enough. Do you think this is enough? That's a fair question. The point is that these graphs let stakeholders have an informed discussion. In particular, if a stakeholder believes they are not enough, the next question is, why not? Those discussions can help everyone drill down to what should be done instead. When you decide to make a change for any reason, you update the assurance case so that everyone can understand what has been agreed to. Of course, how you implement the software matters. You may know what the software is supposed to do and have a great design, but in the end it's the implementation that affects your users. So let's drill into an example of how we can provide some insurance some assurance that our software implementation is adequately secure. As always, there are many ways to do this, but examples can be very useful. So, here's an example. Well, how do I uh, make a case that, my, that security is implemented in the software implementation? Well, I've got this box on the left. Lots of words, but it's pretty straightforward. It says, and I'm just going to read it here. Most implementation vulnerabilities are due to common types of implementation errors or common misconfigurations. So countering them greatly reduces security risks. It's very difficult to make a claim such as, I have absolutely no implementation mistakes in my software. Um, if you wish to be able to make claims like that, there are approaches such as formal methods that may be able to give you a hand there. But for a lot of applications right now, that is um, a harder road than they're willing to pursue. But what you can do is identify the most common ones and then counter those. Since the vast majority of vulnerabilities are the same old kinds of problems, focusing on the common problems greatly manages our risk. Remember, that's what we're trying to do. So all the most common important implementation vulnerability types are countered. How do, can we argue this? Well, it turns out that OWASP has a list of the broad consensus of the most common web application security flaws, and this is a web application. So somebody else has identified for us the most common problems. Great! Let's make sure we walk through each of those and do our best to counter those. Uh, we'll talk more about that in the next figure. There's also, unfortunately, a number of ways to misconfigure things. But we believe that all the most common known security relevant misconfiguration errors have been countered. How? Because we grabbed a relevant security guide, in this particular case is uh, one for Ruby on Rails, walked through the guide, made sure we were configured in a way that was consistent with recommendations, uh, at least to the extent that that uh, made sense. Um, now finally, even if you counter the most common vulnerabilities in implementation, the most common misconfigurations, you could still have a vulnerability. What can we do about this in implementation? Well, the quick answer is harden your application 
What in the world does that mean? It just means you apply a number of different approaches to either reduce or eliminate the impact if a defect still exists after doing all this. So, for example, we force HTTPS in a number of different ways. Perhaps the most important is that we use hardened HTTP headers. In particular, we use a very restrictive content security policy. So, for example, even if attacker manages to slip in JavaScript into our HTML, we expressly forbid JavaScript from executing within our HTML. And this cuts out a huge number of attacks. It means that even if attacker can slip in uh, malicious data, in the vast number of situations, it won't do any good. We use other approaches, such as perform CSRF tokens and origin checking CSRF to counter CSRF kinds of attacks. We also uh, rate limit our email. Uh, we send out emails in certain circumstances, uh, but enforcing rate limits means it's much less likely to, to have mistakes that lead to spamming everybody in the universe. I mentioned that we looked at the OWASP top 10. In our particular case, we looked at the 2013 edition, uh, which was the latest uh, final edition available at the time that we started the project. Um, and it has a list of, well, 10 different kinds of vulnerabilities. And we've walked through each of these to see, have we made a, uh, an effort to counter that? The number one is injection, in particular, SQL injections. Uh, we have a design that specifically is designed to counter SQL injections. Uh, in particular, we use an ORM called Active Record, and for the most part, because it figures out the SQL uh, code to create, it has a built-in SQL injection countermeasure, and as a result, we're fine. If we do write code for SQL directly, uh, we used an approach called Prepared Statements, which counter those. For authentications and sessions, we have carefully reviewed those. Uh, Cross-site scripting, um, there's a mechanism built into our tech, uh, tech stack uh, called a safe buffer, which by default counters cross-site scripting. So we have to expressly disable those protections. And by the way, that's a, a very, very powerful thing to have, you know, by making things by default secure. We counter insecure object references, uh, security misconfigurations, particularly via the security guide. Uh, we worry about sensitive data exposures and try to counter those. In particular, as I mentioned earlier, since email is considered, the email addresses of people is considered sensitive, we expressly do not include them in caches stored on the server. And that way, if a cache is accidentally served to the wrong user, it can't contain the email addresses. Uh, another potential problem is missing access controls. We check on those. Um, Cross-site request forgeries. Uh, we use a number of countermeasures specifically to counter those. And indeed, the underlying uh, tech we use, Ruby on Rails, also has countermeasures for that. Uh, we work very hard to counter known vulnerabilities. To more about our discussion on known vulnerability countermeasures in our supply chain. And we also uh, counter unvalidated redirects and forwards. Here are our key residual risks. There are always residual risks. It is not possible to have zero risk. The idea is to manage your risks, identify your residual risks, and make sure that those residual risks are acceptable to your stakeholders. So let's be honest. I'm going to be as open and honest as I can be and explain to you what are our residual risks. Well, first of all, we depend on external services, in particular services such as GitHub, Heroku, Amazon Web Services. Um, in practice, you really can't avoid depending on some external services at some point. Uh, but these have good representations, have, they're professionally managed, they have a history of monitoring and response, and frankly, it's not clear that if we tried, we would do better. It certainly would cost a lot more. Um, so we don't try to eliminate all possible external services. We just try to manage them so that they make sense. Similarly, third-party components, we depend on them. 
Recreating would be costly, time consuming, and frankly, it's not clear we would do them better either. So we use a number of techniques to manage the risks. We review them ahead of time, and as noted, if there's a vulnerability detected later, we immediately uh, find out about it and can update quickly. Distributed denial of service attacks are a very difficult kind of attack to truly counter. We do use a variety of techniques to reduce their impacts. Uh, for example, we do try to counter easy ones to make it so that uh, a simple request doesn't suddenly make us uh, make the badge app do too much work. So for example, we return data in pages so that we don't try to return an entire database with a simple request. We use CDNs to uh, deal with some problems. We can immediately scale up. We can rapidly cut recover. That said, DDoS attacks are fundamentally a resource on resource attack. Uh, if an attacker has a million bots that are attacking us, um, you know, th there's only so much we can do without additional resources. And at some point, uh, we must decide whether or not we want to spend the additional money uh, for the resources to counter or do something else. Uh, this is not unique, of course, to our system. This is true for pretty much every system on the internet today. Again, zero risk? Absolutely not impossible. The goal is to manage the risk, understand the residual risks, and then you can make an informed decision that, yes, I would love to have no risk. That is not reasonable. This is acceptable risk for my circumstance. But what if you have more powerful threats you must counter, or have more valuable assets? In general, the answer is that you probably need to do more, depending on your threats and assets. You might strongly consider training all your developers on how to develop secure software, designs with mutually suspicious subcomponents, other designs and implementations to limit privilege, reviewing the source code of third-party software, using more and more powerful static and dynamic analysis tools to look for vulnerabilities, a more rigorous and thorough test regime, penetration testing, more thorough detection and prevention measures during operations, and improved recovery methods. In short, you typically need to combine different tools, different kinds of tools, and manual approaches. Where possible, use information about the attackers and assets to target your countermeasures to increase the probability of successfully countering attackers and protecting your assets. An assurance case can help all stakeholders understand what you're doing and have frank discussions about the adequacy of what you're doing. Yes, that may cost more, sometimes much more depending on the threats and assets, but please compare the cost of defense to the cost of failure. All too often people complain about the cost of some tool or applying some measure without counting the cost of a successful attack. Also, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's true that there are no perfect protections, but you can take the software equivalent of basic hygiene steps, and you can certainly combine approaches in a way that makes a system harder to successfully attack. Since no one measure is perfect, you need to combine those measures to make it hard for an attacker to be successful, and to limit the damage when an attacker is successful. I think failing to implement basic measures for protection, detection, and recovery in systems where it matters is just a form of negligence. I'd like to talk just very briefly about a broader issue that perhaps this example raises. This is about science and guarantees and engineering. There have been a number of comments that the science of computer security is quite immature. In fact, some of these papers referenced here mention the practices on which the rest of science has reached consensus appear a little used or recognized in security. There are very few guarantees. There are lots of excesses in terms of what you should do or not do. I think that's actually all true, but that does not excuse people who are developing inadequately secure software today. Fundamentally, developing software is engineering. Because what is engineering? In a very brief summary, it's simply the application of knowledge to design and build systems so that we can actually solve human problems. The pyramids were built without modern science. They're still around, and they're still impressive. 
It is ridiculous. It is absurd to wait for some sort of perfect knowledge about the universe. You're unlikely to develop any actual software or solve any really human needs if you're going to wait for this sort of perfection of knowledge. Instead, what we should be doing when we're developing software or anything else is applying what you know and then including margins for the unknown. Now it is true that there's a lot of unknowns and I think it is valuable that in the long term engineering processes should provide feedback to science and to mathematics and so on saying you know this is the best I can do these are my rules of thumb can you provide more certain knowledge or better information to better guide my future engineering approaches and that's great and that's the way it should work but waiting for perfection and as a result doing nothing at all uh, leaving for example your users woefully vulnerable is unacceptable this presentation has focused on the badge app as an example however if you're involved in developing open source software I encourage you to use the badge app to get a CI best practices badge for your own open source software project Here's the URL where you can start the process of getting a badge. As you can see from the graphs below, there are more and more projects that have started the badge process and also more and more projects that have received a passing badge. We believe that open source software projects that implement best practices are more likely to produce better software, including more secure software. So pursuing a badge is an easy way for open source software projects to self-improve. If you're considering using open source software, then again, look for a CI Best Practices badge. Projects with the CI Best Practices badge are actively pursuing doing the right things, and those are the kinds of projects you want to depend on. So, in conclusion, I'd like to wrap this up. Your software will no doubt be different than the badge app. Certainly you'll have different requirements, a different technology stack. Maybe you have to deal with stronger attackers, in which case you're probably going to need to take stronger measures. But that is totally not the point. The point is that this is a worked example. Perfection is impossible. Instead, your goal should be to manage risk, not eliminate. I mean, if you can eliminate and it's not too costly, that's fantastic. Do so. But overall your goal is to manage risk and really you need to identify your and manage your risks uh, throughout the life cycle and by risks again likelihood and impact you need to consider prevention including hardening you need to consider detection you need to consider recovery uh, the notion that you can do everything with prevention is absurd but the notion that you can do everything just with detection and recovery is also absurd uh, if you try to do everything with prevention, if something slips through, then you can't detect and recover later. But if all you're doing is depending on detection and recovery, then you're also doomed because the attackers will just have your lunch over and over again. You'll never have time to get any work done or it provide any useful utility. You need all of those things. Third-party vulnerabilities can be rapidly detected and acted upon. Uh, we use tools that immediately inform us when a publicly known vulnerability is identified in something we use. We then use our, all our tool, we, we can then immediately update or fix something, and then we can very, very rapidly run our various tools to look for potential problems and our large automated test suite. And therefore, in minutes, we can determine, well, with this update, are we okay? If we can do, we can ship it to production. We can do that in minutes. The notion that you can wait two months after a vulnerability is revealed to the public uh, and, and still not update is a dangerous, obsolete notion. No, you don't have that kind of time. Your time frame is not determined on what's convenient to you. Your time is, frame is determined by when the attackers will show up and do dangerous things to your system and to your customers. So, how can I get in agreement? What should, what should be done? Well, I believe that a very, very useful approach is an assurance case. It just simply documents 
of what will be done or what has been done, including its limitations, so that everybody, all your stakeholders, can understand it. Now, you can always do more. You can always do different things. Um, an assurance case is simply a way to share the information. It doesn't automatically provide you a secure system. It simply is a tool to help you communicate so you can get to agreement on what's enough. And hopefully with this worked example, you can see what might be enough. Now, for more information on how to develop secure software, you might find my book, Secure Programming How To Useful. You can click on that right there. And in the end, I want to convince you it is practical to make software adequately secure. What does adequately secure mean? Well, it's going to be different depending on your application, your threats, but you need to think about it. You need to plan for it. Plan for it and do it. And you can produce software that's adequately secure for its purpose. Thank you very much.